Hi there, I'm Mindy Jensen. And I'm Mr. Mindy Jensen. <laughs> Good name, right? <laughs> and this is the Mindy. And Mr. Mindy. On Money Podcast, where we talk about what happens after you reach financial independence. Why do we call this show Mindy on Money? Because the Mindy and Carl are super awesome, and you definitely want to have them as your best friends, even if sometimes Carl tries too hard to optimize everything, and Mindy makes you feel a little bad for being perfect all the time. Podcast was too long. Wow, that was too long. <laughs> On this episode of the Mindy and Mr. Mindy <laughs> On Money podcast, Carl and I discuss the number one most important financial decision you will ever make. And no, we're not going to tell you what it is right up front. You're going to have to listen to the show to find out. But before we get started, let's take a quick break. Today's episode is sponsored by our best resources. In celebration of February Fi Month, the holiday that we created, we've put together some of our best and favorite resources. Go to mindyonmoney.com slash resources. Okay, the most important financial decision you will ever make. February Fi Month is upon us, and while March is the month that we will be talking about relationships, this episode is releasing on Valentine's Day. <laughs> we don't celebrate. Wait, what day is Valentine's Day? February 14th. Oh, I thought it was the 13th. I'm confused. Yeah, we actually do not celebrate it. We celebrate it every single day. Oh, bother. <laughs> anyway, we're combining Fi Month and March Relationship Month, otherwise known as March Madness, to discuss the most important financial decision you will make. Ooh, foreshadowing. I thought you wanted to call it March Mindiness or March Mindy Month. I'm, I'm, I'm confused. so done with you. Okay. I want half. No. So money is the number one thing that couples fight about. But it goes a lot deeper than just who spent how much on what thing. I think people always say money, but I don't think that's actually true because on the surface, that's what people fight about, the money. But deep down, I think it's really a question of values and what's important to you because that's what you spend your money on. So people will always be like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're fighting about money. But I don't think that's true. I think you have to ask yourself deeper questions because it's really about what's important to you and how you deploy the money to get that kind of those kind of things in your life. Oh, so it's not the M word. It's the C word. Communication. Well, I thought you were going with Mindy and Carl. Why I'm am, glad you picked up on that. Why am I the source of issues? I mean, <laughs> well, I probably am, but. You know, happy wife, happy life. Okay. Have you heard that phrase before? Uh, yes. Okay, you yes, should. Dear. Yes, exactly. Yes, dear. That's the number one comment you can make. Yes, dear. Anything uh, you say, dear. Uh, okay, I digress. Communication is going to be something that you're going to need to have with your partner. And I think, I, I would imagine that people who are in a relationship where they're fighting about money are not communicating. They're not communicating about their expectations for where the money is going to go, their expectations for how their partner is going to behave with money. They're not having open dialogue. I, I would imagine that there's a lot of really accusatory conversation. You spent too much as opposed to how can we fix our finances? How can we do this together? Almost like it's me against you in a, in a sense. I'm curious to hear your take on something. I've heard of couples doing this and we did this for a while, I think, and we never planned it. I think we just did it out of respect for each other. If either of us were going to make a sizable purchase. And I don't think we even had a number in mind, maybe over 50 bucks. Like I want to buy noise canceling headphones. We would run it past each other. And I can't ever remember of a time where we denied another one's request. But what do you think about that practice? I really love this. I, I love that you brought this up. And I love this because that goes to my next word, the R word. Aretha Franklin said it, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. I was going to say Aretha starts with an A, not an R. <laughs> but there's an R in there. When you're having these fights with your partner and discussions about money, anger discussions about money, you're not showing a lot of respect to your partner, most likely. And I 
would love to hear from people who are having respectful conversations at Carl at MindyOnMoney.com. Carl would love to hear it. But when you're having angry conversations with your partner, name calling, I would imagine, comes into play and not a lot of respect. And one thing you brought up is you are respecting me as your partner by not asking for permission. It's more of a heads up. Hey, I was thinking about making this purchase. What do you think? Sometimes, I actually do remember sometimes that I have said no because, oh, we've got one of those already, or we've got 13 of those already, or 412 if you're counting utility knives, which I digress. You're better at finding stuff. I am much better at finding things. But also, it's a, it's a respect thing where you're just making sure that I am aware that you're spending this money. Similar to when I am making a purchase that is not a staple. I don't ask you for permission or even give you a heads up that I'm paying the mortgage. I don't ask you for permission when I go to the grocery store to buy groceries to feed the family. I don't even give you a heads up that I'm doing that because that's not something that falls into this category. But when I'm buying a purse that I really don't need, let's be honest, I'm plug your ears because I, I don't want you to hear, do you really need that purse? No, I don't really need another purse. But when I'm buying a purse that I don't need, I think it's respectful to say, hey, I was going to drop 50 bucks on a purse. What do you think? And you have never said no. And here's another thought. Some people keep their finances separate and others combine them. And we combine them. And there's nothing wrong with either approach. I think both can work. Unless you're one of those polyamorous people, then you have to split it up three ways or how many ever ways you're going. But I digress. In, in any case, because we do share our money, even though I was working before and you were working now, I've never thought of it as my money or your money. And that goes with all our stuff, our cars. And pretty much everything. So I've always thought it's not my money to spend. It's our money to spend. So it's only the right thing to do to run it by you since it doesn't completely belong to me. Maybe if we had separate finances, I would feel like I I wouldn't feel. I don't even want to say the pressure to do it because we never pressured each other to do it. But if we had separate finances, maybe I wouldn't run it by you. I think that's a really interesting point. We combined finances. At the very beginning of our marriage, which is just, we just had our anniversary, our 22nd anniversary on January 19th. Happy anniversary, sweetheart. Oh, that's a long time. Yeah. Get used to it because it's going to keep going. Yes, dear. Yeah. There you go. That's right. Exactly. Uh, so we have been married for a very long time. Both of our parents were married. Uh, my parents are both still alive and they are still married. His Father has passed away, but they his parents were married until his father passed away. So I think it is, and your parents combined finances. Yes. My parents combined finances. I would think that we might have a different outlook on that if we came from parents who had divorced or parents who didn't have finances combined. So what we have seen growing up is what we continue to do. I think we put all of my money, my tens of dollars, into your bank accounts just because you already had, and we added my name to your bank accounts when we got married just because you had automatic withdrawals and, and automatic deposits and I didn't have any of that stuff. So it was easier for me to just close out my accounts. Yeah. And in our specific case, this worked for us because we were so fortunate and I'm so thankful that Mindy was able to stay home. But if we had separate finances, I can't even imagine how that would have worked. Like what I would have just given you an allowance because you're, yeah, and actually you are working, you're doing <laughs> Much harder job than my computer program. <laughs> you're you're taking care of babies, which, given the choice, I'd rather do my computer job. But how would that have worked? What? Oh, I'm no. much rather taking care of the babies. Good. See how well it it worked great right for us. But again, how would that have have worked if we had separate finances? Would I have just given you money to spend? That would have been weird. So I've always felt comfortable and secure, and just pretty much sharing everything, no matter who is making the money. Yeah, and that is exactly how I feel as well. Now, this brings up an interesting point. We never talked about money before we got married. And we have some pretty funny stories around that. Which one should we tell the listeners? My favorite is the coupon on the first date story. Mm, I had completely forgotten about this. And then I think 
Mindy may have reminded me of it, and not in any negative way. I'm not throwing Mindy under the bus. I love that he used a coupon on the first date. Yeah, I, I had this coupon book from some kids going door to door selling coupon books for their baseball team or football team or something. So we went on our first date, and there was a restaurant I liked. It turned out Mindy did not like it. I did not know that at the time. But there was a coupon there, buy one dinner and get one free. For any Chicagoans in the audience, it was Russell's Barbecue. And I think there are still a couple of locations. I know the one we went to has since closed. So I brought a coupon in. I admit I was a bit horrified when you reminded me of that story because I'm not sure. As a matter of fact, I would not do that now. You're not going on any dates now. But I think the important part of that, well, I should just turn this around to you. How did you feel about that? I used coupons too, so I didn't think anything of it. I noted that you used a coupon. Like, oh, he has a coupon. Like, I was excited about it. Or like, either I was excited about it that you had a coupon or I was like, whatever. I definitely was not like that girl on Twitter, which is why I reminded you of this. There was a girl on Twitter who posted, I went out on a first date last night and he pulled out a coupon at the end of the date and I am never going on a date with him again. I am a full price girl or something like that. And I was like, wow, the responses to this tweet blew up and the, they said, give me his number. I would love to go out with somebody who knows how to save money. Or, you know, is conscious of his finances or whatever. Um, there were a few people who agreed with her, but overwhelmingly people were like, I'll take him. And it turns out if you search coupon on a first date in Twitter, you get all kinds of interesting responses. So if you stay till the closing credits, Mindy and I are going to read those after the podcast is done. So stay till the end. <laughs> or if you don't like this conversation, feel free to skip to the end. No, don't don't do that. You know, don't tell them what to do. We're just glad they're here. Yes. Thank you for listening. <laughs> so I think something that gets lost, especially in longer term relationships, can be the level of respect. I mean, we're perfect, of course, as I said in the intro. But we also work at our relationship every single day. And I think that that's another thing that gets lost. It's super easy to let something happen like something annoys you about your partner and it's super easy to let that fester and just compound and all of a sudden you're like oh i am so annoyed by this person i'm going to do things to get back at them and really keeping in mind that this is the person that you chose to partner with for the rest of your life you need to show them respect every single day and have conversations that are hard and have you know, what am I thinking right now? How great I am. Wow, your mind reading skills are terrible. What are you thinking right now? Ooh, let me see. How great I am right now. No, I was thinking that we should have gone to White Castle on our first date because you didn't like the barbecue place I took you to. <laughs> it, I would have liked White Castle better. Yeah, we both enjoy White Castle. That would have been a better choice, perhaps. Yeah, I don't know, because that would have been like, Hey, at least the place you took me to was like a, was it a sit-down restaurant? You ordered at the, the window and then they brought it to you, right? Yes. So not quite <laughs> a sit-down, but it was better than White Castle and probably didn't cause any gastrointestinal distress. That would have been a very bad first date. Huh. Okay. So, but the point I was trying to make is you can't read my mind. So you don't know what I'm thinking unless I tell you. And I can't read your mind. So I don't know what you're thinking unless you tell me. If I want to know what you're thinking, I'm going to have to ask. Same with you. And frequently, I will say, hey, what are you thinking? It isn't because I'm trying to trap you or I'm trying to trick you. I really genuinely want to know what you're thinking. No, I thought it was a trick up until now. Oh, wow. We're going to have words after we stop recording. So it sounds like one of the main takeaways here, and by the way, the most important decision you'll ever make is finding a good partner to spend your life with. But one of the interesting things is we never really talked about money when we dated. Not, not even once, I don't think. We probably did, but not a deep money conversation. No, although did you ever know this? I don't know if I ever told you this. One day I was at your house and you had a paycheck stub on the coffee table. And I peeked at it and I saw how much money you made. And I was like, wow, he's rich. He makes $40,000 a year. I feel so violated right now. <laughs> If there are any attorneys in the audience, please send a note to carl at mindyandmoney.com. That's Carl with a K. 
or Mr. Mindy <laughs> at MindyOnMoney.com. And we need to talk. Yeah. You don't need to talk to him. You can send it to Mindy at MindyOnMoney.com. It's pretty funny. 40000 a year doesn't sound like that much. But back to our point, we never talked about money, but we had the context clues. I didn't feel like we needed to talk about it. The fact that you didn't dump me after I took you to the barbecue place on a coupon that you did not like. And I saw that you drove an extremely suboptimal car <laughs> that looked and also smelled horrible. You smelled great. It was just the car, except if you had just gotten out of it, maybe you would have smelled horrible. No, but I cleaned it up. Yeah. Okay, so I had a car that was really crappy, and then I got into a car accident that was my fault that we're not going to talk about, and I had to get totaled the car, and I had to get a new car. And the only thing that I could afford, because back then I was not so frugally minded and saving minded, the only thing I could afford was a $1,300 Toyota Tercel from the dealership that when you opened the door, you could see clouds of cigar smoke flowing out of this thing. It smelled so wretched and so vile, but I didn't have any other choice. So I wrote my check for $1,300 and I drove this disgusting car to the grocery store and bought two bottles of, I brought one bottle of Febreze thinking that would work. Um, nope, it needed two bottles of Febreze. And I would just open all the doors and trunk and soak the whole thing and just leave it open. Nobody was going to steal this car. It was really, really wretched. But that's what I had to do because I didn't have anything. I didn't have any money. Yeah. I wasn't rich like you. I wasn't rolling in the $40,000 jobs. 40000 a year. Yeah. yeah. So context clues. There were multiple context clues. You used a coupon on the first date, and I didn't get mad. So that's a big indicator that maybe either you think I'm not worth full price or you're conscious about money. So I had context clues, too. You had a condo that you worked on yourself, and that was impressive. So the funny thing was we didn't talk about money, which is kind of strange. Now, to be clear, I think most people definitely need to, and even us, I think we should have talked about it a little bit more. You need to have these conversations. And if you're listening to this, you are probably know something about financial independence, and maybe that's even your goal. And that's a pretty big lifestyle difference than what a lot of people do. So if that is your thing, you better have some conversations with your partner. Let's look at it from a different perspective. I think there are so many correlations between money and fitness. Hear me out. If you were dating someone who was super into fitness and you instead prioritized watching TV and eating junk food all the time, you're incompatible in something that's fairly major to at least one of you in the relationship. In the same vein, if one of you is financially fit while the other is not, maybe the other is in a lot of debt, you're also fairly incompatible in something that's rather important to at least one of you. But money hides itself a little bit more. You don't see the physical evidence every day with your eyes, the level of financial fitness that your partner has while you're sitting here in debt. In fact, it's super easy to hide your debt levels and you just simply don't talk about money. And since m talking about money is so taboo anyway, it's so easy to just not discuss money. And if you have a load of debt and you can tell that your partner doesn't, it's even easier to just not talk about it. You don't want to bring this up and and have them decide that they don't want to be with you. It can be very easy to just ignore. And we've known multiple people in our own lives that have had issues and hide them from their partner. I had a coworker whose partner would hide purchases and parts of the house and parts of the car. He would stumble upon them. And I know you have a story, a similar story with a neighbor. Yeah, at a ladies' night, uh, one of our neighbors in, in a different house that we live in from now shared that she usually tells her husband that something cost about 40% of what it actually cost. And she was so casually sharing this with us. And it just made my heart hurt. It made my financial heart hurt because she was the one who handled all the finances in the house. I'm sure he was struggling with 
where is all of our money going? You said that it only cost $40, but I thought we had $100 in the bank account and now we've got nothing, but he didn't look at anything. So it's it's super easy to put your head in the sand when you don't really want to know the answers to things. But it was just, it was so painful for me to listen to that story. And of course, around the table, everybody's laughing like it was just a joke, but it it was really difficult to to hear that story. And of course, she and her partner thought about money a lot. Shocking no one. I like the fitness analogy a lot because it's similar to money, but it's dissimilar to if you have money in common, you're probably going to have a lot of other values in common. I think it's easy to say, okay, we, we don't have money in common, but we have all these other things in common. I think that's the wrong way to think about it because if you don't have money in common, your values probably aren't aligned and you're going to be dissimilar on a lot of different things because money is an expression of our values. Have you heard the saying, if you're not with me, you're against me? Imagine being with someone who isn't with you. That's going to be really hard. But imagine all of your hard work going up in smoke because of the actions of someone else. Imagine someone actively working against you. That sounds extreme, but we see it happen all the time. And especially when maybe both people were on the same page and then one of them discovers fire and the other one isn't on board, that could lead to some big problems. And you're going to have to either figure out how to reconcile this or maybe go your separate ways. On episode 189 of the Bigger Pockets Money podcast, Scott Trench and I talked to Terry Slater. And in that episode, she shared how when she was still married to her husband, she would do revenge spending where she would get angry at her partner, at her husband. So she would go out and spend money. And that's unfortunately a phrase that I hadn't heard before, but as soon as she said it, I'm like, oh, I know a lot of people who do revenge spending. Oh, you bought a new bike? We didn't talk about that. I'm going to go buy something. I'm going to go buy a $1,000 purse because you bought a $1,000 bike. Now we have to be even. Ooh, ooh, keeping score is also a very terrible way to live. I was one of the last of my friends to get married. Actually, I think I was the last of my friends to get married. And I watched friend after friend talk about their partner and say, I love my partner. I can't imagine life without them. Or we've been dating a while. I don't know if we should get married or break up. If you can't imagine your life without your partner, that's when you start talking about marriage. If you're not sure after dating for several months or years, if you should get married or break up, break up is always the answer. Because the only time you should marry somebody is when you are madly, passionately in love with them and cannot imagine life without them. I once heard a really great quote. I can't remember who it was from. They said, it's not me against you. It's us against the world. And I thought that was a really great quote. I try to remember that whenever you're doing something that annoys me. <laughs> <laughs> like this morning when I was driving. Which... And pulling out in front of that car? Yes, exactly like that. No, I didn't pull in front of the car. I just got a, I pulled the nose out to get a little bit of a head start. You couldn't just wait it until they, I think they thought you were going to pull out in front of them too. Mm, yeah, maybe true. I was just trying to optimize my driving. Oh my God, you can't use the O word anymore. Okay, so what steps can you take to set your relationship up for success as much as possible? What's that C word again? Carl. No, communicate. Communicate. Sorry. <laughs> we should talk about it more. It's not a four-letter C word. It's a, I don't know how many letters C word. Communicate. It's a lot. Talk, ask questions, and truly listen to the answers that your partner is giving you. Look for context clues. Ooh, another C word. Mm -hmm. Two C words, context clues. Nice. Yeah, wow. What is this episode going to be called? The C word? We should change your name to Cindy. No. Cindy on money? Maybe. Then we're going to have to do something else. Cindy on cash. That doesn't even work because it's two different sounds. Stop derailing this show. Yeah, you're right. But 
don't just limit the conversations to money questions. Even though we're talking about money, it's not just about money. It's about values. It's about how you want to live the whole rest of your life. Ask questions that are kind of hard to ask. Be bold in your relationship. If you're afraid to ask your boyfriend a question, what does that say about the strength of your relationship? You can just sneak and look at their paycheck stub if you're afraid to ask. Ooh, that's a great tip. Zing. <laughs> and it's great to have a lot of things in common with your partner, but it's okay to have differences too. We're certainly not the same. I like to listen to good music. You, <gasps> you, not, you not so much sometimes. Movies. We do not have the same taste in movies. We don't. I don't think there's one movie I like that you like. Wow. Well, you watch all those dark, yucky movies. Oh, like like Dune. That's a good movie. You don't like that? You didn't even give it a chance. I watched the first one with Sting in 1983 and the guy with all the boils on his face. That oh, was so gross. That's different. That was, yeah, that, that was not good. It's okay to have differences in movies and music and other things. I would say even money, as long as you're both aware of it and it's not going to cause too much of a rift. If, if one person's goal is to be a partner and live on a yacht and do all kinds of fancy stuff and the other one wants to live in a van on the side of the river because they want to be five first, you're not going to be able to reconcile that. You should just go in your different direction. But I think other money things can be reconciled as long as the gap isn't too big. And as long as you have it all laid out on the table. Oh, you like nice cars. That's not really something that I care about. But if you like nice cars, we'll make that work because that's the only thing you like. So some of the questions that you should be considering before you get even too far into dating are questions like, how many kids do you want? Where do you want to live? What makes you happy? What sort of lifestyle do you want? What are your expectations for marriage? What are your career aspirations? Yeah, they could be two very different things. Like, I'm going to riff on this one for a bit. I would always be asked to that question by managers like, where do you see yourself in five years? And I'd always make up a story. I'd like to be a technical architect or it was just a bunch of nonsense. And what I really wanted was to just be in my cube doing the exact same thing I was doing then, programming the computer or onto a different job that paid me better. So That's I a terrible answer. <laughs> A job interview. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't say that, though. But I had no aspiration in my corporate career. I never wanted to be a team lead or be a partner. And there's nothing wrong with that if that is what you want to do. But if so, your partner has to know about that in case their aspirations are not the same, because that's a big difference. Some money questions you can ask are, what are your money priorities? What are your short-term spending goals? What are your long-term savings goals? What are your retirement goals? Do you like White Castle? And would you be unhappy if I took you there for your 23rd wedding anniversary? Yes. <laughs> yes, you want to go there or yes, you would be unhappy? Yes, I would be unhappy. You can take me there, just not for our anniversary dinner. It sounds fancy, White Castle. It sounds like a very exclusive restaurant. It's not. It's not. So a couple other ones. This is a pretty deep one that I like to think about. If you inherited $10 million today, what would your life look like? What would you do with that money? How would it change your life and what things would stay the same? You and I should answer this question in March Mindy Madness Relationship Month. I forgot what we call that. But in March, we will answer this question for ourselves. It's a really interesting question because some people might be happy with the way their life is just now and other people might want to go a little crazy. I definitely know what my answer is, but that's going to tell you what their values are and what's important. Here's another one, and we stole this from the Playing With Fire movie, which we'll put a link to in the show notes. So here it is. Make a list of the top 10 most important things in your life. Yeah, Scott tells Taylor to do this in the movie, in the documentary. And when she got through with her list, this was, we, we brought this up before on this show. We'll bring it up again because it's so powerful. It was such a turning point. He said, we're spending so much money to live by the beach, but going to the beach isn't on your top 10 list of things that you, that you uh, value most. Yeah, that's pretty striking. They were paying a huge premium for something that wasn't part of their value system. They didn't value going to the beach, yet they were paying for it. Yeah. 
there are some things that are very desirable or you just think they're desirable. I'd love to live by the beach. Me too. But I live in Colorado, which is also very desirable. Not today when it's negative 10, but it's a lovely place to live. I would rather live here than uproot our family and move to Colorado or California because California is much more expensive. We have a really junky pool in our backyard. And when I say pool, I said junky too because it is not nice. But we kind of live by the beach. I don't live by the beach. Oh, it's the pool. We could put some sand back there. The, the pool sucks. We got a discount on the house because it had a pool, if that's any indication of the state of it. Yeah. Tiles are missing. Bricks are broken. It needs to be filled in. Yeah. We'll it do currently this. holds water. When it stops holding water, we're going to fill it in. If there are any excavators <laughs> or landscapers in the audience, <laughs> Carl at MindyOnMoney.com, we could use your help. Okay. Now, this all seems like advice for people who are not yet in a committed relationship or married or living together or whatever. And it kind of is. So what about our listeners who are married but are starting to realize or admit that their partner isn't on the same page financially? Ooh, this is a hard one. And this might be like Scott and Taylor where Scott discovered fire and his wife wasn't quite on board. I've heard this so many times. It's probably the number one question we get from people, how do I get my partner on board? So we're going to talk about that on a future episode. But in the meantime, I think all this just goes back to communication and laying your cards out on the table. Sadly, there's some people who I think change and neither person is at fault, but one person's priorities have just changed. And in that case, if the gap is too different, the only course of action might be to separate and go in a different direction. But I think most people could probably work through their problems if they're honest and willing to put their cards on the table and willing to communicate and work with the other person. And life is about compromise, too. You're not always going to get everything you want. I think that's really interesting. If we had discovered, if you had discovered financial independence and come to me and said, I want to retire early, and I would have said, no, I want to be a partner in a law firm, which is never going to happen because I'm not going to go to law school. But I wonder how we could have made it work. I mean, you did retire and I did go back to work. And I don't have any resentment over that because I know that I don't have to work. And I think that, again, back to that C word, communication is the key. If you are the partner in the relationship who has made a big change, this big discovery, and you're going to veer off in a different direction, you owe it to your partner to have these conversations and to look at it from their point of view. On episode 157 of the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, Scott Trench and I talk about how to have a money date with your partner from the position of being the one who's interested in money and financial independence and talking to a partner who maybe isn't on the same financial page. And the top key point that we make is don't come at your partner from an aggressive position, from an accusatory standpoint. You need to stop spending so much money. It's not a statement that's going to be received well. I can guarantee anybody who says that to their partner is going to be met with ice, especially if this is an argument you've had before. And if it is an argument you've had before, your partner is going to be less receptive the more they hear it, not more receptive. Pro tip. There's this myth of a statistic that says 50% of all marriages end in divorce. And this came from the 1970s where divorce was spiking for a variety of reasons. But what I think is even worse than divorce is apathy, disinterest, disdain for your partner. That's an even worse conclusion to your love story than separating completely and going your separate ways. So make the right decision for your mental well-being, for your financial well-being, and choose a partner that is truly a partner for your life. Alignment in all things isn't necessary. But like we talked about with money, you're never going to be exactly alike. And I think that's important, too. I think you should embrace the differences. If you never have any kind of disagreement or even a fight in your marriage, I think one person's being a pushover, one person is being a pushover. 
and there's probably something wrong there. So you're not going to be on the same page all this all the time, but you do have to be aligned in your core values, the things that truly mean the most to you. That's the key to your happiness. And if your partner and I don't agree on those things, then it might be time to do something else. Happy Valentine's Day. Do you, you see what I did there? I just told people they should break up, and then I said, Happy Valentine's Day. Yeah, that's lovely. You said 50% of marriages end in divorce. Do you think 50% of divorces end in marriage? No. I know some people who are divorced who say never again. There's a lot of divorces that are so ugly. So one question before we end, and remember to tune in for the Twitter commentary in a moment, but... Do we share the same core value of White Castle? Or if we can't say that, I think we both can agree on In-N-Out Burger. Is that correct? I would go with In-N-Out Burger over White Castle, but I think we both share the same core value of White Castle. However, I don't get pickles on my White Castles. Ooh, I like pickles. Welcome to our little Twitter experiment here. Mindy has put coupon on a first date in the search box in Twitter, and we are going to read some of the responses right now. We haven't done this before. You want to take the first one? So he says, coupons on the first date is crazy. That's for a shorty you already know. And the response is, I don't care how into you I am. That'll be the very last time you see me. What is a shorty? A shorty you already know? Is that I think that's like just the person that you know or like your girlfriend we're not here to discuss slang okay so let's read i'll read the next one if he uses a coupon in a restaurant on a first date then he's not that into you wow this one i love this was a twitter poll would it be a turnoff for you if a guy used a coupon on the first date yes 11.4 percent no a whopping 88.6 percent would it be a turnoff no. I wonder if, because he worded it slightly backwards, if people answered wrong. Oh, there's answers here. Even if, even I would fall in love, I already know that he, she knows how to take advantage of good discounts. A guy with no money is not a turnoff at all. Oh, I think that's, how old are you? No, a man who knows how to economize makes a good partner. No, please save money. I would be impressed. No, turn on. I love a money sensible king. No, we love a man who's careful with his money. Coupons are elite. I love some frugality. More money for dessert. That's pretty good. That gives me hope for humans. Okay, here's another one. Ladies, if he uses a coupon on the first date, is that a red flag for you? Let's read some of the responses there. No, I went out with a guy that would keep the receipts after so he could claim it as a business expense. The IRS probably wouldn't appreciate his accounting practices. Uh, He likes saving money. That is something that is a huge green flag. Wow. Uh, It's tacky. Don't let me see it. No, save that money. Heck no. I love a saver. Groupon is amazing for dating ideas. No, but where are we at that allows coupons? That's an interesting take, too. Are you offended by the fact that he took you to some place that had coupons in the first place? That's interesting. Does what castle? I know Burger King has coupons. Whopper, whopper. If you say yes, but still want him to pay for your food, you are part of the problem. Redeem that beep before I get there. If the place has coupons in the first place, you have no reason to be upset because you're still there and you're still going to eat. If I say I'm going to make him dinner, I'm going to Walmart with my EBT card. Is he going to be embarrassed while eating steak and shrimp? That's a good point, too. I think this is a nuanced situation. There's definitely a difference between being cheap and frugal. If someone invited you over for a first date and they served you leftovers, I think that crosses the line. That would be cheap. And a coupon, maybe, but I think that, and I'm biased because I did it myself, but I'm going to say that's more frugal than cheap. Using a coupon on the first date? Yes. Okay. I would agree. Thank you. That's you at date number two. Yeah. Are you seriously coughing on the show? You can't cough during a podcast recording.
No, I was thinking that we should have gone to White Castle on our first date because you didn't like the barbecue place. I took you to. <laughs> it, it sounds fancy, White Castle. It sounds like a very exclusive restaurant. It's not. It's not. Whopper, 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 oh my God, whopper. I'm so done with you, 150%. Whopper, whopper. No. Has anyone heard that commercial? Everybody's heard that commercial and it's horrible. Okay. So Minnie and I do not share that core value. No, get up. Core value? You're such a weirdo. Burger King means the life to me. Burger King, whoever their ad agency is who did that ad, dropped the ball so hard. Whopper, whopper, oh, whopper, stop. whopper. <laughs>